This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal, medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Hey there, it's Brian, Sebastian, Movie Reviews and More, live on K4HD Radio Talk for Media, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, Apple TV, all over 100 outlets around the world. And I can tell how this show is going to go already. Uh, we're going to have technical problems, but you know what? We'll get through it. So I've been waiting for this show. Like I've been waiting for this young lady for the longest time. Tosh, good thing that you're back in Miami. It's good to see you in Los Angeles last week. Don, stop. Good to see you. We all got a chance to get together last week. Steve, it's good to see you again from Verdugo Entertainment. So I got to put Cindy Cowan and wanting any of this young lady's time. Cindy, I'm going to have you introduce yourself because you've got a long list of stuff that I'm not only proud that you accomplished, but you, you, you've got a great company. All right, Cindy, who are you? Where are you coming from? And welcome to Movie Reviews and More. Producer. Um, and um, what can I tell you? I, I was one of the first female distributors ever in the film business, have produced, I don't know how many movies, um, actually on the way to Serbia to do a movie for Sony next week. And um, it's great to be on the show. Okay, Brian Freeze. <laughs> Definitely. We're probably, we're probably going to have oh, to take no. over when, as Brian comes back from the metaverse. He's <laughs> <laughs> a little bit late, so we're, we're going to work through this technical issue, but we're good. So, so Cindy, hi. My name is Natasha. Um, I'm from so, Miami, and I... Oh, he's back. There we go. Hi, Brian. Brian. You're back. I don't think he's back yet. I think he's still playing. Oh. <laughs> go ahead, Tosh. Go anyway, for it. Tosh, go for it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so I'm from Miami, and I saw that you started your career here yeah. in Miami. What did you? What did you do? A movie, or, or what? Did, what started your career? I am Miami born and raised, so go Miami. Oh. I love Miami. Um, and I started at CBS um, at a at a local news affiliate. Um, being, you know, climbed my way up to being one of the associate producers of the evening news there. And that started my career, left as a songwriter and came to LA, transferred into the film business. And But I go back to Miami all the time. I love it down there. Wow, CBS, yeah, I always pass by their uh, their station. Um, it's like, I forgot where it is, but I've passed by it before because I used to work for Cox Media Group, which was in Hollywood. And then sometimes I would pass by the CBS. That is so cool. Oh, now I feel so much love because you're from Miami. <laughs> right? I know. Most people don't know that there's another Hollywood. So I actually always say one from Hollywood, Florida, dropped the F and came to LA. And if you know Hollywood, um, my family was the Diplomat Hotel down there. So, you know, we, we had a very large hotel in Florida. How far from uh, Miami is uh, Florida? I mean, I'm familiar with it, but I just don't know the distance. It's Hollywood. Hollywood's yeah. in the middle of Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. For those who didn't didn't know, I'm here in California. I have like I have friends in Tampa. I have, I, my cousin actually lives in Miami, 
um, and I need to I need to get out there and visit Tosh, and I need to get out there and visit my cousin. Right? I am afraid. It's really. I wish they had tax credits so I could shoot movies there. It's it's an amazing place. All right, Steve, you're over here in the corner with all these ladies who are not talking. So, tell us a little about what you want to do. What would you like to know? <laughs> Who you are and what you do. Uh, boy, um, I'm currently involved in uh, in uh, restoring a lot of films uh, so, uh, for Dugo Entertainment. Uh, I started, actually, I started my film career in Florida. I was directing uh, uh, horror and sci-fi films there. Uh, moved out to L.A. in 1995 and, and wrote a whole bunch of, of, uh, of movies out here. Uh, and directed a couple more, and uh, I'm working in this film restoration stuff now, which is a lot of fun. How does film restoration work? What what exactly is that? What we're doing is we're finding movies that are that are orphaned, uh, classics mm -hmm. that that might have been made 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago that uh, haven't shown up on Blu-ray or streaming, and. Uh, we sort of do det detective work to find the elements and then we find the owners and we make a deal and we bring their films back to life. And uh, we did a couple of great ones with uh, the Tom was involved in that were shot in Texas in the late eighties. And uh, we did a film that he did in uh, 88 called action USA last year wow. and uh, had a bunch of great stars in it and huge stunt work. And then, our latest release is a, is a horror film that he did about the same time, also in Texas, that, that uh, actually streeted today. So um, we just kind of, that's the fun part for me is going out and finding this stuff and uh, getting it restored and getting it out there to audiences that haven't seen it or haven't seen it in 30, 30 plus years. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, the old school classic horror movies from in the '80s were always the best. So, I bet, I bet that's fun, you know, remaking those. Well, sure. I mean, everybody that watched these movies in the '80s were, you know, 10, 15 years old, and uh, suddenly they're rediscovering them. You know, there's a huge nostalgia for the '80s stuff right now, and so we're certainly happy to take advantage of that. Yeah, where are you kind of finding these movies? I mean, what's kind of your resources? To... Well, we jokingly call them uh, barn finds. Um, <laughs> the uh, we did a Roy Rogers film last year that came out in 1976. Uh, it was his last movie. It's a classic film, and I pursued the owners, the family that owned the film, for three or four years, trying to convince them that this needs to get out and, and find a wider audience. And they finally were convinced and, and came aboard and we, we got it done. And then we had to search for the elements because they were mm -hmm. supposedly lost and we were able to find those. In terms of Tom's film, Tom is a, is a uh, multi-hyphenated filmmaker. He's a, he's a director of photography, he's a producer, he's a director himself. And Tom had been the director of photography on, I don't know, three or four films that I had written. Uh, and so, he knew me on that basis and he approached us a couple of years ago and said, Hey, I've got this movie action USA that we did. Are you interested in doing anything with it? I said, yeah. So <laughs> it kind of went from there. So sometimes you look for them because it's something you're looking for. Sometimes people come to you and say, Hey, we want to get this out. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? Like, I guess a lot of these are BHS, um, well, Action USA and and Ghost Riders, which is the new one, are classic examples. These are movies that came out in the 80s on VHS mm -hmm. and did really well and then disappeared. And they're not on DVD. They weren't until, you know, recently. Uh, they're not streaming. Uh, just kind of lost films. And there's so many movies, particularly from the from the 80s that are out there that have never seen the light of day since VHS. Yeah, I, 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 I could imagine, and I'm sure that what is how long does that process take to take a VHS film to like digitize it or like kind of is it? Timely? What we did, the trick here is that we were lucky enough to have um, film elements. The owners actually had yeah. film, so we went back to film as opposed to back to tape. Brought the film in, did 4K scans. 
um, so that we got it into the HD world. And then once we do that, we sit down and start cleaning it up, trying to sort of scratch the rust off until it, it looks the best version that it could be, look from, from that era. In the case of Ghost Riders, we actually had Tom with us uh, to guide us through the restoration process, which is always what you prefer. You want the filmmaker to tell you what it needs to look like. Mm -hmm. And process-wise, takes a few takes a few months off and on. You try a little bit, you clean a little bit, you converse with the with Tom, and then we do a little more. That's kind of how it works. Okay. Nice. Is uh is uh, uh Brian uh, back yet, or is he still <laughs> about to come in? He's I don't know. I don't know. Thomas, you're over yes. here. You, um, you yes, want to I say gotta, a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> I kind of missed most of it. Was talking about we just, we just yeah. started talking about it. So I'll bet they'd love to hear some horror mm -hmm. stories from the set. Because you guys, you had, what, 18 days to get this whole thing made? Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it was either 18 or 12. I can't remember, to tell you the truth. 12 seems more likely what it was, but it could have been 18. I think it was Action USA that was 18. So, yeah, tw yeah 12 yeah, days, no waiting. How do you make a movie in 12 days? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't oh. know. <laughs> I don't want to do that, but I have been doing it lately. But uh, it was tough. We, we had a basically a non-professional crew. I mean, I had worked on a couple of things, and the director had worked on a couple of things. But for the most part, it was all Baylor students and friends and family. And... Uh, we really didn't know what we were doing at the time, but it was, we had a blast and it turned out okay. Nice. I feel like that's what's important. Like when you do anything, like I'm a, I'm a singer. So anything that I do, like everything I do is very organic with like either my friends help me, my family helps me. So it could be like a little crazy, but it's like so much more fun when you have like, you know, people that are related to you or that share the, your passion and then your dream, like help you, you know, make it true. I'm true. So for these horror films, mm -hmm. um, the restoration, is it is it the same movie or does it have like a little bit of some different elements? Um, how 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 are they? It's it's pretty much the exact movie. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing we did, uh, Steve, we we did change the look of the, the ghost cowboys a little bit. That, that was the original intention, you know, to have it kind of blown out a little and make it look a little different. But at the time, we couldn't afford to do it. And now through uh, this process, we could do a little bit to it, but we wanted to keep it pretty much the same, mm -hmm. which uh, I guess the only other thing we did was the, some of the music. Is that right, Steve, in the opening scene? Yeah, and it, the, the trick here is, is you know, we sat out with Tom, and the story basically is these cowboys, these outlaw cowboys are killed off in the late 1880s, and they come back after the family of the people that killed them off for revenge a hundred years later. And they're in full cowboy regalia, they're on horseback and they're in the present day. And when we were talking about this with Tom, one of the things he said was, you know, we really wanted to have the cowboys have kind of an ethereal glow on them when they're, we see them so that the, we know they're not quite of this, this world. And in those days, in the 80s, you had to do all of this as a, an expensive optical effect if you wanted to do this. But the technology being what it is, once we've got it into HD, there's all sorts of electronic things we could do to, to create that effect that, that Tom and, and the group had always wanted to do. So that's what we did there. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the mu music, there's a, there's a sequence at the beginning over the main titles leading into a flashback at night in a Western town and there was there was music missing there they just had not been able to score it at the time i'm not sure why tom it, maybe the just choice was made to not do it yeah i i remember some music being there but i don't know why we don't have it but... it, it may have been a mi mixing problem but we we decided well, let's get some music in there but the trick was we wanted to make it sound of the period we wanted wanted it to sound like the rest of the score of the movie and also the kind of instrumentation that they used in those days, which was primarily synthesizer. Mm -hmm. and, and so we we had a lot of fun sort of matching the, not only the style of the co composition, but um, the actual sound of those 80s soundtracks. So that was fun. 
And then, and then oh, I guess I, I, guess I, I feedback. Feedback. I'm hearing myself talk. I'm sorry. As far as um, some of the original actors, and what's kind of the feedback from them or their thoughts? Or uh, I've spoken to a couple of them, uh -huh. and they're they're very excited about seeing it. You know. Uh huh. So. Uh, I, I don't know if they've gotten it yet or what the deal is, but uh, I spoke to them, I think it was about three or four months ago. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a couple of them is, have passed away, but uh, the younger ones are still around. And, and I think one of them is still in the business. Uh huh. Yeah, that's got, that's got to be exciting because if you resurrect like old bodies of work they haven't seen, you know, in, in years, I mean, I, I could see that would be, that would be exciting for me, you know, if I had yeah, done that in the past and then you had like, have, like resurrected it, you know, for for everybody else to see that hasn't had the the, the chance. Cindy, well, talking I'll, about horror, I, sorry, as, uh, what was that? Cindy, as a producer, what are your thoughts on this? Would you take on a project like this? Well, they're they're bringing back and resurrecting old projects, so yeah. that's totally different than what I do. So uh, it sounds fascinating, but cool. Yeah. I gotta say, Cindy. Oh, Brian. Brian's back. So, Yay. Cindy, I was, I was, I'm like, so, Cindy, I was gonna ask you, with all the things that you've done, uh, yeah. being an iconic woman in the business, and getting to do for what you've done, what's what's one of your most proudest, you know, achievements? Would you say? Because you look up really highly in the industry and stuff, and I love. I've been watching the stuff that you've done for years. Plus, I've done all the interviews for all your movies going back to years ago. Thank you. And I just want to know what's some of your high points when it comes to that because you've done a lot of great stuff. Yeah, you know what? Getting any movie made nowadays is an achievement, so I'm proud of all of them because there is every reason why a movie won't go forward. Um, but I, you know, I to me the the thing that I'm most proud of out of anything that I've done is um, I got Humanitarian of the Year award. A couple of years ago, and out of anything that I've gotten, Emmys, you know, included, Humanitarian of the Year is my favorite. Um, but going back to movies, like I said, it's so difficult to get anything made these days. That any, my hats off go to anybody who actually completes one and gets it out there because people have no idea. There is every reason why your film doesn't go, um, you know. And so yeah, I'm just pleased that I'm still in the business and, and this is going to be one of my best years ever. And um, yeah, I can't wait to show you guys what's coming next. There's two back-to-back -back Sony movies that I'm very excited about. Are these going to be thrillers or horrors or what? So are they? one is um, in the horror space. It's based, um, both of them are true stories. One is based on the first and only exorcism ever broadcast live on TV in the 70s. It was actually oh God, I just got yeah. <laughs> and it's what happened to the family after the cameras turned off. Interestingly, it was before the movie The Exorcism, before Poltergeist, before Amityville Horror. So nobody really knew anything. Casper was the only ghost of reference. And so when they did the exorcism on this house, they had no clue that you can't exercise ghosts and what was going to happen to the family. So um, that's the movie I'm about to go shoot in the next week, actually. And then I follow that with a musical based on the group In Sync, And um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's based on two girls that in real life um, were in college and decided that they would rather go and tour with In Sync, And they ended up going in The Price is Right in hopes of winning the RV. So they would have wheels and a roof over their head. And they did it. They won the largest payout ever in Price is Right history. And this is the journey of them um, traveling around with this band. So it's kind of almost famous meets girls trip. Wow, that sounds like yeah. a really great. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Usually fun. Usually girl, girls trip movies are always funny and mm -hmm. always a yeah. great time to watch. Those are my favorite ones, honestly. Right, me too, me too. This is loosely based on the real girls 20 years later, helping yeah. recapture their childhood um, 20 years after the fact. So yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Will they be kind of help, like not helping, but giving their like opinions on like what, like how to direct or are no, they gonna no, no, be involved no. in any way? 
not really. Um, although I did get to meet both of the real girls and I'm excited. I, you know, it'll give them an opportunity to go and talk shows and do whatever they yeah. want to do afterwards. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun for them. Stephen Thomas, I was going to ask you guys, mm -hmm. what's it feel like to, have, to bring those iconic films back out? Last week, last time we talked, we were talking about Roy Rogers, and that was fun to see because a lot of people have not seen that history. And Thomas, when it goes back to cinematographers, in my opinion, really, really important because it's the overall view of how to make these great movies. And I, I, I never want to have a lost movie out there. I never want to have a movie because, like Cindy said, it's hard to make movies. And I want people to see you, whether you're staying at home, hopefully you're going to theaters because everything's changed, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy they're able to put these films out, you know, because I've got a whole bunch of movies that have completely disappeared, you know, because they never made it to DVD and stuff in some TV movies that I'd love to see again. And Steve? Yeah, it's a, it's a fun process to dig this stuff out. And it, whether it's a film that you saw, you know, 20, 30 years ago and mm -hmm. want to revisit, it's just it's nice to share this stuff with people. And it becomes a new film, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's the process. Tom's a guy that's still working constantly. And so uh, it, it's interesting that he's he's having to focus on the films that he's involved with now and yet somehow get his, his mind back in into 1987 to make creative decisions as we're as we're reforming this movie. And this was a movie he did when he was a kid. I think this was the movie Ghostwriters that basically started your career. Right, Tom? Yeah, I was 26. It was the first film oh. I shot. Yeah. And it's uh, it's uh, it was quite a trip, I'm sure, for, for Tom to, to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I learned a lot, and it was, it was so much fun to make. You know? So I'm so happy that people are going to get to see it again. Cindy, when you think of going back to going back to Crash, going back to your earlier movies, talk about how tough that was for you to break in, because one thing... That stuff is iconic. When I see it, I know I'm going to see a good film. When I see your name up there, I know I'm going to see a good oh, film. Thank you. A lot of people. Thank you. Um, it was tough to break in back then, more because there wasn't very many females in the business. But, um, you know, I've had some people ask me, was that difficult? And I actually used it to open doors. Um, you know what I, what I used to do? All the, girls, the doors will open now you just have to be smart enough to stay in the room. And so, you know, it was, it was an amazing time. Um, I was lucky enough to meet and know the right people at the time, but I mean, you know, um, this is my second time going back to Serbia to shoot a movie. The first time I was doing an Oliver Stone movie with Dennis Quaid. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to do these films and to get to go to some of these countries that you would never ever have an opportunity to go to um, in another incarnation or another life. So, um, you know, look, like I said before, it's difficult. Um, there's every reason to stop you. I, I got stopped twice last year with COVID. I've tried to outrun this pandemic this time. We started the same movie in London and um, COVID happened and we shut down and then we were moving to South Africa quickly, and then the variant happened. Mm -hmm. but now I'm on the way to Serbia, but I'm very close to a war about to happen. So, you know, the things that you never think about when you're planning. Um, but you know what? They, they it's all part of filmmaking, and um, I, I love what I do. You know, and Steve, the last time we talked, going back to you, you were talking about how the pandemic was pretty good for you. You got to focus on some environmental effects. Well, it's, it was interesting because I know you're a fan of, of Tom's other film, Action USA. Absolutely. And it was interesting with that film because everything was shut down at the time we, we finished and released that thing. Theaters were shut down for the most part, uh, at least in L.A. And none of the studios were sending out new product to theaters. And Action USA was a movie that, that had a it had one of the stars of the movie is currently a, a re, or was was currently a recurring character on the Bosch series, um, uh, Gregory Scott Cummins. Um, it had a lot of B famous B action stars in it, and it had this amazing organic stunt work. Basically, the movie was put together by a bunch of stuntmen, big name Hollywood stuntmen who had worked on A pictures, 
and they decided, hey, everybody's making bank, making these low budget action films. Let's do one, but do real big budget movie stunts, which they did in Waco, Texas. And uh, so this movie comes out. This is back in the days when there was no CGI. The stunt work was all uh, organic. It was guys and, and girls putting themselves in danger to do these particular stunts mm -hmm. and these action sequences. So this movie, we restore it, it comes out, it starts playing in theaters, Alamo Draft House all over the country. It was playing in theaters in, in Ireland. And it was because it was so unusual and so different from what people were used to seeing that it actually did really well. We got a lot of, of traction because of the fact that it came out. And that was in part because of COVID because there was no competition out there. and audiences love the film so that that's kind of how it helped us and it's it, i think it it's probably helped some of our other stuff because people are skewing more towards seeing the stuff at home hey gosh you know whose movie it was john that's, Stewart. that's um, literally what i was just thinking i was like wait i remember this name and i remember john told me when it released and i'm like is it the same one because you said yes. stuntman, and I know he was a very like well-known stuntman like for years. Yeah, John, you're talking about John Stewart? Yeah. The director of the film. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That was Tom's partner in crime right there. Yeah. Wow, very yeah. cool. So Tom, I did a few I did a few songs with him, so that's how I, I know who he is. <laughs> so Tom and, and Cindy and everybody and, and Sammy, good to see you there. Is that uh, John and I go back to the nineties. So what happened, he introduced me to Tosh two years ago, said, you should have this singer on your show. Well, I like Tosh so much, I made her a co-host, and it became through John. So when this came out, it's like, oh, I'm going to have this come out through Verdugo and, and get Verdugo Entertainment. I'm like, okay, that's good. And then the next time I'm interviewing Steve for Roy Rogers, and then he's talking about Thomas, and we had Thomas, we, we had never had a chance to get together, which is why everybody's on here. So I've got a segue to this because Sammy's good to see you. All right, Sammy, have to tell us who you are and where you're coming from because you and I talk all the time. I don't even know if you know Sammy, but I know you've interviewed Sammy's clients, you know, before in the film. Hold on a second. It's a little, the connection's a little weird over here. Uh, <laughs> guys. Oh, God, sorry. It's my dog. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> oh, uh, it's good to see you, for one. Yeah, we're all having bad internet or whatever. Yeah, talk it's... about who you are. What's the joy being that iconic person that you are? What what made things happen to me to be the kind of person I am today, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about your brand and where you come from. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, I've been um, in front of the camera since I was three. So I'm a third generation child prodigy. Um, my grandmother, my mother's mother, actually started um, singing for the troops in vietnam in five different languages believe it or not wow. and she was a pinup model during that time so and she was in pageantry so um that's where the story began and my mother kind of took over and she was the dodge girl this was back in like the 70s um and i was in my first commercial when i was three with her so she was the panasonic girl the dodge girl uh she was miss chicago and won uh, a numerous amount of pageantry and television, different things that she did. Um, and then of course I followed in her shoes. So I actually wore the same dress that my grandmother wore back in like the forties and fifties. Um, and then my mother wore when I think it was probably the early sixties, I ended up wearing it in 1989 when I was Miss Illinois. So I was in the Miss Illinois pageants to get to the Miss America on television. So I started working on TV as a little kid, um, did modeling with OP Swimwear and Marshall Fields and a bunch of other companies when I was younger. Um, and from pageantry, I really enjoyed speaking very much. Um, I received my cosmetology license when I was 16. So I started doing events. Um, and then I started working with celebrity stylists and I met celebrities that way. So I started doing a lot of shows about hair and makeup and fashion. And so I kind of started on the red carpet interviewing those people, um, how they got to those looks, where these trends came from. And then of course, from there, um, I started in the movies. So my first movie was with Mel Gibson in 95, was Payback. And from that point, um, when I got married in uh, 2002, 
um, I became pregnant. I was living in Chicago at the time because that's where I'm from. I lived in Chicago for 35 years. And then my husband at the time had said, you know, great opportunity on the East Coast. And that's where he's from. And so I said, how long is it going to be? It's like a couple of years. And I gave up my entire career in the beauty and fashion industry to come out to New York, which is like the Mecca capital of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know anybody here. I had my daughter. And within a short period of time, um, I went a little batty because of <laughs> having a baby and not having anyone around. So I needed more brain power. And um, of course, my my now ex had said, why don't you start with business cards and start doing events like you did in the beauty and the fashion world and whatever have you. So I started doing that. And um, from there, um, within six months, I had a full business, which is very rare for the East Coast because they usually hate wedding planners, event planners, anything of that sort. Um, I got someone to like me and someone to listen. And uh, they started sending me clients. And of course I knew nobody here. So I kind of started from scratch. And within six months of me planning events for people, weddings, all kinds of different trade shows and more, um, and Fashion Week again, um, I was contacted by True Entertainment for the East Isle Network to be a part of a new show they were having about weddings. And they asked me to star in the show. And I was like, one show, why not, right? Uh, next thing you know, it wasn't just one show. It became 12 seasons, and then I was tapped to do a whole nother show, and then I've been in five reality shows since then, all well, talk shows. Um, and the face of many large brands in the world, Hilton being one of them, so I became their spokesperson worldwide for their entire brand starting in 2010. Um, Party City jumped on that bandwagon. They never had a celebrity spokesperson. I was their first, so I was their celebrity wedding planner and celebrity spokesperson for their brand. Um, and then Bloomingdale's jumped on and so multiple other brands. Um, from there, I got my own talk show and, um, I've been working on the red carpet the entire time, whether it's movies, being on a television series. I, I have a lot of credits that I have to really update <laughs> during COVID has made me realize I really don't have a lot of information. I mean, I have a lot out there, but there's a lot more that I need to share so that people understand there's you know expertise in in those particular areas as well but i absolutely love this business you know since covid new opportunities have come up um while my events and not being able to go on the red carpet in la um i was actually one of the first uh people not to be able when this happened in 2020 i ended up i probably getting covid and at the end of 19 so in december And then had it through January. And then, of course, we had the Oscars um, and planning to get out there in February. And they started closing California down, if you guys remember that. It was Mm -hmm. this flu and it was spreading. And they first closed down my hotel. I got another hotel. And then that was canceled. And the flights were canceled. And it just kind of went mecca down from there. And um, since COVID, um, I've become um, a lot more back in the brands again. Because taping for me, um, they start offering you, you know, less money to do the things that you normally used to doing. And you don't want to depreciate the value of what your career has presented for you. So um, I'm going back into being a celebrity ambassador for shoes, um, evening gowns and a skincare line and possibly now a, a antibacterial when you travel kind of thing. So. I'm looking into that. So that's everything that's been going on. It's it's a lot. <laughs> I, try, I try to summarize my background, but it's pretty vast. Um, and I like it that way. I like being able to do many different things and um, having more opportunities open up since we've been through all this mess. Looks like things are starting to open up and people are starting to want to get back to the, not what life was, but what life is now. Um, and reestablishing themselves. Cindy, can you talk about what the new protocol is? You're getting ready to go overseas to do your movie. What is important for you? Because you have to be careful with everything. You talked about the experience of almost being shut down twice. What do you have to do extra this time to make sure it doesn't happen at the same time? Right. So the Sony protocols are pretty tough. Um, they are requiring everybody get um, be triply vaxxed before they'll even allow you on the set. Um, we obviously have to get tested 
72 hours before getting into Serbia. We have to be tested again every single day of our shoot. Um, it's cost our production over a million dollars of COVID mm -hmm. costs. And then we wow. also, which will be quite difficult, uh, you know, a lot of times these sets can be kind of trying anyways. And so um, what's what will be a little bit more challenging with this one is we're really not allowed to go out to lunch or dinner. Um, we've got actually a COVID person sitting there making sure that all of us leave the set and go back to our hotel rooms or apartments and stay there. Because if one or two of us um, get COVID, the entire set shuts down. So it's really important that we all stay safe and they will test us every single day. Every Not day? Eight. Every day, yeah. I think they would go crazy. They haven't really put those rules on us. Um, you know, if we're, I'm actually working on a, a new show right now. It's actually um, right after it's a post Oscar party, the Rio Gala, which is about diversity and inclusion. So I think they're going to be honoring Samuel Jackson and LL Cool and a bunch of other people. But it looks uh, I'm very excited. I have not worked with them before. But I was discussing with that. It's funny because I'm in the planning. I said, you know, we really have to look at the PPE standard for California right now, because we're talking about 450 people in this place. Yeah. And so I've been looking at all kinds of, you know, just standard for swag bag, PPE sanitizers, masks, those types of things, because it's not, the mandates are still there. So. Sony itself gets very, um, you know, I, I can't speak for other studios, but we're required to wear the N95 masks at all times. <laughs> Side. So the, new, the ones that yeah, like no one's filming. We're we're also put into bubbles, so um, I will be able to speak to four people. Um, you know, gone are the days when you can get very close to the actors or you can get close to the hairdressers or whatever. You're literally put into a bubble. Um, so the protocols are pretty serious, but you know, there's millions and millions of dollars at stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would think when you leave the country, I think that you would that the standards that they have there are much different than here and probably much stricter. So you would have to be very careful. Yeah. Well, Steve, this goes back to you and Thomas. So since you're mainly working in can I say a closed situation and what you guys are working on, would that be right? I'll let Tom answer first because he's he's actively making films uh, in, yeah, in the we're, U.S. right now. Yeah, we're you know I start one on the twenty eighth and and we get tested you know basically every other day. Uh, everyone has to be vaccinated. We wear the mask all the time, and there's a COVID officer there, and you know we do basically the same same stuff as everybody. But uh, you know, which definitely makes it more difficult to make a movie. Mm -hmm. Hey, Beth. And Steve, talk, Steve, talk about the release. Uh, the Blu-ray release was last week, February. Today, no, the, 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 no, the DVD was last week. Um, the Blu-ray is today. Okay. There it is. Wow. Um, lots of extras on the back. Part of the story of this movie is how they managed to pull it off, and there's an audio commentary. There's a brand new documentary that we did with with uh, Tom and the uh, other writer producer Jim Desmarais, uh, a behind the scenes documentary on on the stories that they went through making it. There's a actual vintage documentary that was made at the time the movie was filmed, which has a whole lot of behind the scenes uh, footage, uh, trailers, stills, everything. But that that comes out that came out today. Natasha, Sorry, you broke up, Brian. Did you have a question? Oh, huh? yes, for Samantha. Oh. For Samantha, yes. So I love, I'm always begging my friends to get married because I just love going to weddings. So I can't even imagine like how stressful it is to plan a celebrity wedding. So what, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure you've done so many celebrities, but which one would you say, like, is there a celebrity that you haven't done a wedding for that you're like, oh my God, I hope one day they get married and they call me to do their wedding? Um, you know what's interesting? Because uh, um, 
I didn't think that I would wish for this person, but because they're trying to make a comeback back into Hollywood. So Lindsay Lohan just got engaged. You know, she was oh. always a great oh. actress and she got engaged. And so I've been talking to her mother about working with her. She hasn't really made up her mind yet about that. But uh, I'm very happy for her. You know, she's really done well for herself since she moved out of the country. She didn't like it very much here. Obviously, you know, she's been um, in Dubai and mm -hmm. been doing all kinds of great things, um, whether it's movies, dancing with the stars in Australia, which it doesn't really matter. But she's trying to get herself to a good, stable place and trying to make her way back here. And I, I would really love to see that happen for her, to have something kind of wonderful and dreamy and, you know, have a wonderful, she seems to have a wonderful relationship with her, her fiance. Um, that's what I'm working on right now. So that's the one, you know, I've worked with a lot of different celebrities from football players. I've worked with people in politics. I won't mention that here because I don't want people to throw if they're one way or the other, I don't want them saying <laughs> worked with who I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> I did for six years. Um, and it was one of our presidents. So it's, uh, it, you know, we worked with private events and um, all kinds of celebrity functions um, and fundraisers. But I've worked with a lot of different people from, you know, Conan O'Brien to, um, oh God, Melinda Williams to Sean O'Brien from the Giants, Derek Foster from the Colts. And um, I've thrown party for John Stamos and um, I've done things with Kathy Griffin from our show, um, I could keep going, but <laughs> the, they're um, they're like normal people, just like you would be. You know, they get stressed a lot differently because depending on what type of celebrity they are um, and the type of guests that we have that mm -hmm. are at their event, um, it's a lot of pressure to look your best because a lot of them are published for magazines. So usually, when I'm planning, I usually get calls from magazines asking for you know, first right or refusal to be able to publish somebody's wedding and do it the right way. And so you have people with cameras there, you have people, they have deals with magazines. Um, and so a lot of them throw a lot of fits a lot. You know, I have a new show coming out it's called The Main Event, and it's about celebrity events mm. and my team. So I, I'm not going to tell you everyone that's in there, but there's some pretty high profile people who are pretty demanding and it's <laughs> how do I say this I'm a really straightforward person and so you know for me to walk off the set that's common um if I tell someone to f off that's common <laughs> um, so, but, you know they'll send me the, the people that I'm working with are doing a wedding for or like a special premiere or depends on what they're having but um they'll usually sit me down and say we're cool, right? I'm like, yeah, we're cool. As long as you don't piss me off again, I'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> so it's between both of them, you know, our teams are stressed. They get uh -huh. starstruck sometimes. You've got a lot of people, you know, um, depending on who you're working with, you've got a ton of people that invite A, B type celebrities. And you've got a group of girls that are not used to being around people like that, like I am. When you have award shows or they're all in one place and you're running to the front of the line to get an interview and they remember you every time, you know, it's, it's a lot different. So it is stressful, I think, for for everybody, because um, in that world, again, depending on where you are and what you're doing, um, it's a big deal. You need to look your best. It needs to look mm -hmm. perfect. Everybody needs to walk away saying it was a better wedding than Jessica Simpson or any of those other people. Um, it's, you know. It's the luck of the draw. I've had some great mm -hmm. celebrities I've worked with that are super calm and just say, I trust you. And those are words that you treasure for a lifetime because mm -hmm. for someone to trust you with their special day and with TV and with pictures and with all of that other hoop de la, you know, the, the decor is like the big deal. They want people to walk in and just feel like, whoa, you know, they really went all out here. Cindy, I have a question for you. We've got about five minutes left. Would you enter this business now knowing what you know, Cindy? Would I enter this profession or is that what you yeah. said? Yeah. Um, mm, yes. I will say that it's a much harder industry right now than it was before. Meaning um, the streamers have changed the complexity of what we as producers do. Um, it seems like there's more content out there and that's true, but it's more going into TV now and longer content and feature films. But yeah, um, 
the film business has given me the most amazing life. So yeah, yeah. I, I still would do it. It's I, I would it for a second. Cindy, well, because of COVID, right? Cindy, and I, we are still able to do what we love, but Absolutely. it's different now with streaming because I feel like, you know, um, I'm watching myself on a computer, not like mm -hmm. regular TV. You know how they did it with a black magic camera. It's not the same anymore. It's like now people are doing it with their 5G 13 or 14 iPhone. And it, you know, has that same streaming quality to it, which I find a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. Well, the same question for Steve and Thomas. Would you guys enter the business now, knowing what you guys have gone through, what you know? I would, but I'm I'm glad I did it earlier. <laughs> yeah. It's not as much fun today, I don't uh -huh. think. Right? More stressful, more more guidelines, more rules, mm -hmm. you know? It's hard Steve? to break the rules now. <laughs> Steve? Yeah, I would. I think it was difficult to, it was much more difficult to get into it when I started. As with Tom, you had to shoot on film in those days. And that was permanent. You know, you, you didn't get to back it up, erase it and start over. So it was it was tougher to get into. It's easier to get a film made these days. It's harder to get it seen because there's so much out there on those platforms that, uh, you know, you're, you're so many people get lost in the shuffle because there's so much content. And that, that's one of the reasons why you know, us film critics were always wanting to make sure that people see these films, whether it's on DVD, whether it's streaming, it's so hard to see everything. It just is. And I never, I knew it was going to come the day where I can't say anymore. I've seen everything. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And for me, that kind of stuff, I don't like that. I want to be able to support what Cindy is doing, you know, what's, what Samantha's talking about. I want to be able to refer these things, especially when it comes to DVD. And obviously, you're storing films. So, so, so important because that's the last thing I want to do is leave the film. And Tom, if I can, can imagine, you know, it's, that's what I don't want to happen. Yeah, I, I think our industry has changed quite a bit since COVID, um, which makes it a little bit scary for especially the new people that started, you know, getting a name for themselves right before COVID. But I can't say that COVID hasn't opened up a lot of opportunities. They're just different. And the world right now, as it is in film and streaming, as Cindy was saying, it is a different experience. It's still exciting to be able to do what we love, but there's a lot more components that have to come into play in order for you to make those things work. And if something goes wrong, someone becomes positive for COVID, whether they have it or not, or those things on sets, we have to close down and discontinue what we're doing. Like everything just switches into another plan, which is usually we have to wait. Mm -hmm. And waiting can sometimes be a very tiresome thing. I think that's the hardest thing for me is that I'm not used to being home. I'm used to traveling so much, you know, going back and forth to the West Coast or, you know, leaving the country to do different projects or fashion shows or red carpet. Or I have some films that I was supposed to start right before we um when it's shut down out here, if you remember Long Island and New York, we were the first ones to really like get locked down with all kinds of rules and everything pretty much just went. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm finally starting to see the light. Like I said, the opportunities are out there. There's a lot of content. There's a lot of things that are in the works. So there's opportunity. I think it's just, you know, we're still in a waiting pattern a little bit. So it's, you know, a little bit stressful still. Yep. All right. So Steve, we, uh, we're in the last two minutes. Give you social media links, why people should see what you have made up. Go, go for it. Well, people should see it because it's one of the greatest low-budget uh, horror films of the of the late 80s, and you've not been able to see it anywhere except on VHS. Ghost Riders. You can get more information by going to verdugoent.com. That's verdugoent.com, and there's lots of information on this uh, Blu-ray, and it's a phenomenal movie. Thomas? Uh, just... I, I agree with Steve and, and Action USA as well. I think it's just great we get to see these old movies again. Yes. And Cindy, talk about what you, you can talk about real quick and your social media link. Social media is Cindy Cowan 1000 on Instagram and Twitter. Just my name on Facebook. Um, my website, should anybody want to see what I'm up to, is um, Cowan, C-O-W-A-N-E-N-T.com. 
And um, I've got some really commercial popcorn movies coming to a theater near you. And the next time you come on, we're going to talk about the equestrian world. I'm in the world yeah. of Dressage. Would love that. It's all about Dressage for me. You never <laughs> get to it. So hey, yeah. next time you come back, we're going to talk about horses. Absolutely. Got it. Media link. Oh, mine, uh, Terry Marie nonstop on all platforms. And then my website is terrymarieofficial.com. Tosh? And me, you can find me at Vocally Tosh on all streaming pl on streaming platforms. You have mail, social media <laughs> platforms, but you can stream my music on all streaming platforms, or you can find them on natasharoombosmusic.com. And Samantha, social media links? My link is uh, um, Instagram, Sassy Sammy, 58. <laughs> and uh, my website is samanthagoldberg.com. Very easy. Okay, what a challenging show, but I had to get everybody in here. I had to bring everybody back in a different way because it's, this is on me. So I can always say this. Have a good night tonight. Have a better day tomorrow. If you see someone without a smile, please give them one of yours because the world needs it. I'm Brian Sebastian. Movie review some more and have a good night. But also, you know what? Go out and support this movie. Please go to the theaters in a safe way. Please buy those DVDs because a lot of jobs are on the line. We will see you next week. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you.